Welcome to Tell Me Your Story, New Paradigms for a New World. I'm Richard Dugan, your host. Thanks so much for joining us here on the program. We stream live at richarddugan.com and newspress.com, and we archive these programs at richarddugan.com, the radio show's page. It's always a thrill to come your way here on the program and uh, bring you information, uh, information, insight, inspiration. We certainly hope so. Encouragement, confirmation of what you're up to, and uh, we hope that you will uh, join us. Today's program is going to delve into, and I always have trouble with this term, this phrase, because it sounds a little odd. Um, It's a subject that is near and dear to my heart. Now, my guest is going to sit there going, what in the world does that mean? How can death and dying and transitioning be near and dear to your heart? It's a subject that has intrigued me for as long as I can remember, because when I hear of people passing over, and again, there's so many different terms in this regard, uh, and going to the next world. And I'll use the prime example is um, a few years back when the pop star Michael Jackson passed away the day before my 50th birthday, I believe. Uh, felt like he took the wind out of my sails. Anyway, uh, I wondered what he was doing, what his essence or its essence was doing at that point. Because my understanding, and we'll get clarification from our guest in a moment, is that there is no gender on the other side. We just are who and what we are. We are neither male nor female, or we're both. Anyway, uh, so that's always uh, intrigued me. I've had guests on this program who have talked about intentionally uh, inflicting, if you will, or taking on uh, an out-of-body experience, not a life-after-death experience uh, or near-death experience, but an out-of-body experience, which is supposedly along those same lines. But what's over there? And... If it's so wonderful, why do you keep coming back? So we're going to find out uh, uh, some of these answers with our guest, the author of Answers About the Afterlife, a a private investigator's 15-year search unlocking the mysteries of life after death. His name is Bob Olson. And Bob, thanks so much for joining us on the program. Uh, Thank you, Richard. I'm really happy to be here, and I can already tell this is going to be uh, an interesting conversation. Well, I, uh, as I said in the in the front end of the program here, uh, this has always intrigued me. Uh, I've had a few relatives. I've had my grandmother and grandfather on my mother's side pass away when I was um, still in single digit years, or at least uh, early preteen or teen, if you will. Uh, my parents are still alive, and uh, and I'm not going to say thank God because when it's their time, it's their time. Just like when it's mine, it's mine. But we all have these questions about whether or not there's anything on the other side. And uh, from uh, what I was taught, not only as I was growing up, but also working for 15 years in a Christian radio station, I was basically told that you get one shot. It is appointed to every man once to die and then the judgment. And I thought, then I don't know that I want to die. Because <laughs> I don't think I want the judgment because I'm going to be judged pretty harshly because I haven't been a perfect person from, the, uh, you know, living up to certain standards. I haven't been a perfect person. Any None of us has. That's right. Which is sort of the, the leveling of the playing field. It's like, I don't care how much money you have. You got as many flaws as I do. So not, so what? And so you live on the streets. You have as many flaws as I do. You know, big deal. There's no ranking. Um, first of all, uh, how in the world did you as a private investigator – uh, how did seeking after answers to this, th- these kinds of questions about the afterlife even come up in your t- time as a private investigator? Uh, you know, it certainly wasn't something that I, uh, was, was striving to do as a, as a young boy. Um, I, I lost loved ones like, like you, and I didn't really think too much about life after death. And it wasn't until I was in my mid thirties, my father died. He was, uh, 64 years old. And I guess for the first time in my life, I really thought about, I wonder where he went, you know, and, and it got under my skin enough that because I was a private investigator at that time and, and, you know, doing what private investigators do, I, I thought, well, who better to have the skills to to investigate this field and find out if there's really anything to it than me? And and that's uh, that's what got me started. So, of course, I didn't 
like so many other people, you know, when you first have these questions, you go, well, where, where do I begin? And I really did not know where to begin because, you know, now in hindsight, I can say I was a skeptic. And so as a skeptic, I wasn't, I wasn't learning about this stuff. I wasn't recognizing, you know, good places to go to investigate life after death. And it took me almost two years before I found any evidence at all. Uh, but that's sort of how I got started. So when you, uh, is it, is, is your investigation predominantly regarding the process of transitioning or are you focused more on what is on the other side for us to experience? You know, at first I just wanted to find out if there was life after death. Uh, so I think this is, this is gradually, uh, got taken new levels as I went along. And, and when I, when I eventually was convinced by the evidence that we don't die, that there is life after death, then new questions arose uh, as time went on. And I started to think about things like past lives and, and, uh, and, you know, I had heard about near-death experiences. So one thing just led to the next. And uh, the answers to all those other questions came as a result of that. So there, that's how, those were the questions I started with. And then all the other answers, it's been now 15 years. It's been 17 years, but I don't count the first two because I didn't find any evidence. So 15 years since I first found evidence of life after death. And, uh, yeah, that's what happened. The, the new questions came along, and I tried to find new ways to answer those. I know that for myself, uh, watching various television programs, especially a lot of the sci-fi stuff, um, there are times when I'm watching an episode dealing with the transition, let's say, of uh, humans, uh, the human evolutionary process to whatever the next level is for us as depicted in this program. And sometimes I look at that going, Wow, that that kind of rings true. That feels right. That I think that's probably what happens, and uh, and so I'm curious as to whether or not. Um, obviously, we don't take our bodies with us because we've got them buried all over the planet. Uh, <laughs> and true. so, so what I'm wondering is, and I'm, I'm I'm beginning to wonder whether that was a real a good idea in the first place, uh, in that context. But that's what we do. Um, what is it that, from your investigation, leaves the physical body that, um, I, I, because I've actually um, uh, um, uh, saw something where they actually did some measurements, physical weighing and measuring of the human body before and after, and that the body was light by, I don't know, three or four or five tenths of a pound. And they couldn't wow. account for it. So I'm that's curious as to what 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 is it that that leaves? Because uh, something has to leave because we're no longer animated. From what I understand, and, and and this is based on the evidence that I've seen 15 years, and of course my understanding, as I said, grew in levels over time. But the way I understand it now, what leaves is is our consciousness, and and it's that part of us that we might consider our personality or, you know, some people might just call it the mind. And it's, and it's something that doctors could dissect the brain all day long and never find. They don't know, they know where, um, certain, certain things happen in the brain. Uh, they know what parts of the brain light up and, and what, what they represent. But when it comes to consciousness or what some might call the mind, they really don't know where that is. Nobody's ever found that. And that seems to be what leaves. Now, that's one, one side of it. The other side of it is it's the energy, you know, that energy that we call life. And uh, if anybody who has been with someone who has died, and this can, can include a pet, uh, you recognize that, you know, one second you see life in that body and then the next second it's not there. You know something left. Uh, you don't have to be a scientist to, to identify that. And it seems to be some kind of electrical impulse that gives us life, that allows us to move, allows us to talk and think and do all those things. And it, this is all this is all the same thing that I'm talking about here. Mm. And that seems to be what goes into this 
other dimension. And when I say other dimension, we can talk more about that. I'm sure we will. But um, it's not something that really is far away. It's not up in the clouds. It's not some distance, p- distant place. It's, it's really all around us. And uh, as spiritual beings, we're just vibrating at a higher frequency, uh, a frequency that, you know, kind of like the dog whistle works on dogs, but humans can't really hear it. Um, us, we as humans, we as physical beings, really are not able to see the spiritual beings, although there seems to be some people who have a better ability than others. So what about your background, especially from the spiritual perspective? Uh, where, uh, where are you on that spectrum, on that, uh, on that wonderful little kaleidoscope of, uh, that yeah. we like to call religion? Well, I grew up Catholic, uh, but, you know, not a strict Catholic. My, you know, my, my family, you know, we went, we went to church uh, during the holidays. Um, we went to church when there was a wedding or a funeral or if the, maybe there was something, uh, some challenge my parents were going through and they felt it might help to go there. But we, we weren't stri- strict Catholics in that way. What I did, I went to catechism. And um, for most of my life. And what I found in, during those years was that I wasn't getting the answers that I was looking for. So I was one of those kids, uh, there's many of them out there who just probably asked too many questions. Uh, at least that was the, the interpretation I was gathering from my teachers was, you know, just listen to, to what we have to teach you. Don't ask too many questions. And, um, and so the foundation that I had from uh, my upbringing as a Catholic, and this probably isn't true for everybody, but it was my story, is that it wasn't a strong enough foundation to answer the many questions that I had about life after death. And then as I got older, and especially as I was a private became a private investigator evidence became everything to me uh, i was taught by all the w- lawyers that i work for don't even come to us with anything that's not evidence because we can't deliver that to court with us and and I, I i carry that over to all parts of my life including this this spiritual aspect of myself and uh so i didn't have a name for it but i didn't believe in anything because i had no evidence from which to believe. And, and so that's sort of my upbringing. I think it's, it's quite interesting, uh, especially considering the fact that I have had the same perspective when it came to reincarnation, saying that, well, I'm going to have a hard time accepting that unless there's some kind of proof, i.e. a baby's got to come through the womb with a rock that can be carbon dated <laughs> thousands of years old kind of thing. Um, And so I'm just curious, when we talk about the afterlife, most people think of something that is non-material. So I'm curious as to your evidence to support the existence of an afterlife. Well, there's two things I want to say about that. I'm going to preempt that that conversation with what I say at the beginning of answers about the afterlife and the end and uh, parts in the middle is, is I don't want anybody to take my word for any of this. That, that's not my intention in writing a book. It, it was not to convince others to believe what I believe. Uh, the reason I wrote the book was because I happened to be lucky enough to have spent so much time investigating life after death. And I wanted people to know what conclusions I came to based on the evidence so that if they decided to sort of become their own afterlife investigator to do this on their own, they would at least have some, some paradigm from which to begin, uh, which is something that I didn't, which is why I started two years without any evidence. So, so that's where I want to start with that. You know, the evidence that I found along the way, you know, there was great evidence. Uh, Some of it was, you know, getting readings with mediums. This is, I would always pick a stranger. Uh, the medium would be a stranger, man or woman, didn't matter. They didn't know anything about me. My very first one, only knew my first name, I paid in cash. And I had a three-hour reading with this person. And the evidence that came through was amazing because uh, she was able to name loved ones that were in spirit, people who have died in my life, name their first names usually, 
Um, tell me what their relationship was. Tell me what they looked like physically, what they did for a career, um, what their personality was like, even how they dressed. So I had all these these initial sort of uh, areas about their personality and their character and their life that this stranger, of course, couldn't have known about my loved ones. And then and then after that was usually where the more vague messages would come, messages about love and forgiveness and that sort of thing, um, how, how proud my father was of me. But, you know, it didn't just begin and end with mediums, you know. So one of the next things that I did was I ended up having a, a, a past life regression, like you mentioned earlier. You know, I, I was interested in what, what about past lives. And so I would have a personal experience where I would – a uh, hypnotic regressionist would basically just put me in a relaxed state and then, uh, you know, guide me into a past life. The, the regressionist had no idea what that was going to be like, and, and they didn't lead me in any direction. I ended up having an amazing experience. And what I want to say about this is that even with the readings, uh, with the mediums, and then the same thing with these regressions, it when I learned by doing these things, and, and there were others as well, but I learned that we get to a point where we have to recognize that the evidence is sacred to us. It can be meaningful to us, but it's our own personal experience. And so, for instance, you know, I've seen where through a medium, a father um, was, was telling the medium, the his daughter's uh, nickname that he had for her, which was Jelly Bean. Now, for that girl then to go around and tell people, I had this great reading, and my you know my father called me Jelly Bean again, and you know it wouldn't have much meaning to most other people, and they wouldn't think that that was great evidence. But what's interesting that I learned over time is it's sometimes it's these silly little things, these little details that we know that this medium couldn't possibly know, or some of the most interesting experiences we had in that past life regression that you just know it's true. You, it, you go from a belief to a knowing and you recognize that, wow, this is amazing. This is real. And it, it is sacred to me to the point where you actually don't even care if anybody else believes you or not. And that's what ends up happening when you begin to investigate life after death. We're talking with Bob Olson. He is the author of Answers About the Afterlife. It is a private investigator's 15-year search or research unlocking the, uh, the mysteries of life after death. And I am interested to find out from you a little bit more about this aspect of the afterlife. What can you tell us? Uh, well, let me let me back up uh, to another question. Um, you've 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 been to a, a regressionist. Uh, is to check out past lives. You've been to mediums. You've done all of these different things. Have you ever had either an out of body or a near death experience? No, no, I haven't. And boy, I, you know, <laughs> do you want it, one? <laughs> uh, yeah, I would love to have an out of body experience. Yes. Okay. No, no near death. No near death. No, we'll skip that one. <laughs> um, so having not had any firsthand experience. In, and, and again, I'm not being critical here. I'm just curious as to the answers uh, to a number of very fundamental questions that most people are going to want to know, uh, especially what's on the other side. All right. Well, uh, it's a, first of all, great question. And, and, and how do you know? Well, one of the, the way to understand the afterlife best is through personal experience and versus vicarious experience, you know, hearing somebody else's story. Um, and so when it comes to my own personal experiences, I, t I mentioned past life regression. I mentioned what was that was that was like. There's something called a, a life between lives regression. And this is where a guy named Michael Newton was a hypnotic regressionist and brilliant man that he is decided when he got to the end of that lifetime, that past life that someone was going through, he decided, what happens if we keep going? Well, what if we don't stop the regression experience here? What if we just keep going after the death in that lifetime? What happens at that point? And he realized that people go 
into what he calls the life between lives, what I would call the afterlife, the spirit world. Um, also call our true home. And when you have these kinds of experience, so I had that experience more than once as well. That's, that can be up to a five hour experience, which is amazing. And when you have these kinds of experiences, what happens is when I would then interview, because uh, someone who had a near death experience or even an out of body experience, these were now vicarious experiences to me. But the only thing that, the only way I could even give them any credibility credibility at all is because when they were telling me about those experiences, I could relate to many of the, th the things they were saying based on my regression experience and my life between lives regression experience. And because there were so many similarities to what they were telling me and what I experienced, I was able to at least relate to those experiences and feel as though there's probably something truthful to what they're telling me because these two things, you know, had many parallels in many ways. Does that make sense to you? It certainly does. Certainly does. Uh, and of course, we're going to kind of jump through some of these fairly quickly because there's just so much to cover uh, yeah. that we can't really expand too much. Although I will let our listeners know that uh, we have what is called an after view, Bob. Yep. And the after view has nothing to do with the afterlife. It has to do with the rest of this interview that people will be able to hear after the radio broadcast has left the airwaves by going to richarddugan.com, going to the radio shows page, and you will hear the entire interview in its it, it complete and uh, uninterrupted all the way to the end. And that's the downside with radio is, of course, you're, you're subject to time. And to that end, we actually do need to take a, a short break. And, and we're going to come back and talk more with Bob Olson. And he, again, the author of Answers About the Afterlife, a private investigator's 15-year research unlocks the mysteries of life after death. I'm Richard Dugan. This is Tell Me Your Story. Stay where you are. Welcome back to Tell Me Your Story, New Paradigms for a New World. I'm Richard Dugan, your host. We're talking about uh, the afterlife. We're talking about that which takes place after you transition. Not the process, but the post-process, if you will, of existence in the next world, the next realm. Uh, and, and I know that uh, Bob Olson, author of Answers About the Afterlife, there are many theories uh, that some one says that everyone has a different experience because of their own personal um, uh, uh, material world experiences in this dimension or plane, if you will. Uh, others say that, hey, it is what it is for everybody. We're all going to the same place, uh, whether, you know, one belief system or philosophy says that you're going to have a multitude of this or you're going to meet judgment or you're going to uh, live in a chocolate fountain or whatever the case may be. Um, and and there would be those who would argue that, well, how can anybody really know? Because nobody's ever really come back to really tell us. I mean, there have been people who've had the near death and out of body, but they don't stay. They'll see the light at the end of the tunnel and they'll see the bodies. They'll see the, say the religious figures uh, saying, Hey, you want to come, come on. If you don't, Hey, you can go back and you can help aunt Sally and your brother and your, and all of those different things. And I often am, am, I sometimes think that, uh, Bob, we're, we are so attached to this world that even if we're going through the death throes, we don't want to leave because it's so intriguing to be here. And yet I am so intrigued. I'm not pushing the process, mind you, uh, but I am so intrigued by the other side. What about you? Are you, d does that... I mean, by just by by doing the research that you've done, I mean, the, 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 some of the things that you've brought up and the questions that, that are posed, it seems to me like you're just as curious about what's on the other side. You're not just this isn't just a project for you. This is something that's going on inside of you that says, I really want to know what's over there. Yeah, uh, it did grab hold of me and, and wouldn't let go. Uh, I can't believe that I'm still doing this after all these years. Uh, I I. Uh, I think a couple of things you said that I really want to say. Yes, I, I am 
very interested in in getting these answers, and I do recognize that um, it's true that so many people are attached to this world and the way we want to understand or even envision the afterlife is we want to envision that it's more of the same. And so it's very difficult um, to explain the afterlife the way I have recognized it over time because it's it's not like that and and so for some people that's a big shift to make and and they don't really like hearing what they've heard for many many years and and i don't like delivering bad news but the the reality is it's not bad news it's just different news in fact if anyone were to read answers about the afterlife uh, i think they would feel wonderful about the afterlife and and yet and I do uh, so that's one of the reasons why. But I I I'm not anxious to go there because I recognize that I'm here for a reason, as we all are, and I believe we're all here to have uh, certain experiences. And uh, these may have they're not predetermined, but I, I think we I think our souls that's the way uh, the term I use our souls that that part of us we might call our higher self that stays in the spirit world uh, made a decision to have. A human lifetime and w- hoped that we would have certain experiences and then our free will allows us to choose whether we are or we aren't uh, that's a great thing about being a human being we we have free will but um, but understanding the afterlife is is all about uh, being open-minded and recognizing that it's not necessarily the way we think you mentioned very early in the introduction that there really is no gender on the other side. Well, you know, try to tell somebody that their father, who is now deceased, uh, is, isn't a male or a female, and, and that'll kind of blow their mind wide open, right? So, so uh, yeah, that, that, I think that's the biggest difficulty for most people is getting over the idea that it's not necessarily uh, a duplicate of our world, but it's something entirely different. Well, I know that that anytime we talk about these concepts, uh, that there will be those who they they have their they have their beliefs, and and I'm not going to sit and argue or try to dissuade them otherwise because I'm looking for the answers just like everyone else, and yeah. just because I found the answer today doesn't mean that something else isn't going to come along tomorrow and say, well, yeah, that's what it was yesterday, and now it's to, this is what it is today. Uh, only because we are constantly gathering new information. We're having new experiences. Um, I've, I've heard this analogy used on a number of occasions where if you or I were to go back 100 years, let alone 50 years, with just our smartphones, the people then would, they would just go nuts. They wouldn't yeah. know what to do with that. It would blow them, <laughs> it would blow them away. So, you know, we're not here to blow people away by any means. Um, when we start talking about, let's just say, uh, especially when we, cause, I mean, you couldn't help but delve into uh, the religious slash spiritual aspects of this. I mean, that's what this is. It's a spiritual experience is what it is. What about a creator or God or whatever other name we want to put there to that force, because I, I don't necessarily see a personality in that context, uh, as, as I have evolved, if you will. Um, I, I begin to understand, at least from the diverse belief systems and philosophies, what what is out there that is guiding us? What is it that is uh, uh, out there, or I shouldn't really say out there, but that's with us? Uh, this is a great question, and it's a great follow up, you know, to what I was just talking about. Because at the very beginning of answers about the afterlife, I talk about my my understanding of God. Now, again, this is my understanding based on the evidence that I've seen, and you said a brilliant thing which is that truth evolves. Now, and when I, I want to just say, I, I do believe that there is a, a universal truth that exists that we'll just say we as, as souls understand. But I think that our 
human minds may be incapable of fully comprehending that truth. Um, but even if it's not that, because of our education and our experiences and our beliefs, we filter whatever it is that we see and we interpret things differently, each one of us. And so therefore we can only know our truth. So my truth and your truth are both perfect. Neither was right or wrong, even if they're miles apart. Uh, and yet, like you said, uh, they will undoubtedly change over time. They will evolve. And then uh, to me, it's not that yesterday's truth was wrong and today's is right. It's that we just see a bigger picture of it and we understand it more fully because of our awareness. So to me, what is God uh, as of today? The way I understand it based on the evidence is again what you said. Uh, you could have written this book, I think. I don't see it as a personality either. I see um, God as creative intelligence. I see God more as energy than entity. But that makes perfect sense based on what I was saying earlier about what is it that leaves our body. Um, it's the energy that gives us life. And this is the energy that, that is the creator of all. And in, so part of that energy that gives us life is what this, uh, some people will call God and some people will call creator and I'll call it creative intelligence, but people who have had near death experiences, people who have communicated, people who are in the spirit world and have communicated through mediums that I, I find legitimate and credible have all described God to me more as, as energy and uh, rather than having a distinct personality the way, uh, the way I was taught as I was growing up. Yeah. Well, I, I have to say that, that again, this, this whole aspect of, uh, uh, of contemplating what's on the other side. And then I guess one of the other questions uh, would be, uh, what do we do over there? I mean, are we doing paperwork? Uh, <laughs> are, yeah. Is there paperwork that we have to fill out, uh, reports that we have to fill out from this life? If we have to remember everything <laughs> and, and account for, for the money that we spent and then and, and the resources that we used and so forth? What, what, what are we experiencing? What can you tell us from the folks that you have uh, gathered this information from uh, that you've been told, this is what we're going to be doing over there? Uh, there's a lot of things that we do. Uh, you know, one of the things that we do early on after we pass is we have what's called a life review. And we do review our life. And, and people will describe this differently. And again, part of it, I think the descriptions that are being made we'll say through people in spirit through mediums is is just for my benefit or our, you know our benefit because it's the easiest way for us to understand them some will describe us as having this life review looking back at the life that we just had in almost a three-dimensional movie screen you know 360 degrees but allowing us to see the ripple effect of our free will choices and actions and what this just means simply is that we are able to see how our life impacted the world, how it impacted other people, both individually and collectively. Uh, this is one of the experiences that we have. I believe, based on the 15 years I've been doing this, uh, and this, this took some time, this really only came in the last few years, that the human lifetime is... I'll give it a percentage, but uh, this is just uh, hypothetical. Say half of it is us here in the physical world, and the other half is us examining it and dealing with, uh, you know, not dealing with, because that's a terrible way of describing it, but learning and growing from what we um, are able to observe from that higher perspective now based on what we did. And it's also in watching our loved ones who have survived us and see how their lives move on. And in many ways, we will recognize how our lives while we were here affected their lifetime for the, for the rest of their lives. Uh, there are things that we'll say, we all know that our parents, 
uh, taught us or did for us or uh, the love that they showed us when we were very young stays with us for the rest of our lives. So one of the things, and I think one of the most important things that we do as um, spirits, spirits that have less, left the human body and gone back into the spirit world, is, uh, is observe our life, see you know, what we did really well, what we didn't do so great. I don't believe that we're being judged by anyone. I believe that the God that I described earlier is all love, is all all joy and peace. Uh, those those sort of woo-woo terms that you hear, but I, I've heard nothing but wonderful things about that God and uh, look forward to being in that God's presence, presence from a spirit world perspective. But it is that, it is that God or creator that is helping us, not judging us, to get through some of the things that we maybe f could have felt we did, we could have done better, and maybe we're judging ourselves. That's the only judgment that's going on. We're kind of judging ourselves. But, you know, we have to understand, too, that when we look at something that we, we might feel as though we didn't do very well, it's, it's surrounded by all kinds of other things that we did very, very well. So there's always a great balance in any one person's lifetime to make them walk away and and overall feel pretty good about what they did. I have to say that um, uh, one of my favorite movies in that regard is the one with Albert Brooks and um, Meryl Streep uh, in in terms of uh, their life review and what he goes through. And and he's thinking he's being tested and she's just having a great time. <laughs> and, yes. and that yes. he he it's like an exam and he he wants to pass it and and it's like uh, wait a minute no 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 this isn't a pass fail this is just a review we're just showing you you know and and he just doesn't quite get it at first but it's really fascinating and and um i i i have to say too that there are so many different movies that that have come out uh, of of an inspirational nature uh, not of a horror type of nature yeah. that have been, I have to say, somewhat helpful in that regard to viewing the passing of a loved one. Um, I, I certainly know some of the stages uh, uh, that we go through when we experience the passing of someone. And I remember the anger that it talks about and hearing about people who would get really, really angry. Then I had a dear friend of mine uh, pass away October 10th of 2003 in our home. And, um, it was that weekend and we were laying there just trying to rest and recuperate from all of the emotion of the last two days. And all of a sudden this utter rage came up inside of me. I was so mad that he left as oh, yeah. if, as if he had any control over it. <laughs> So that would be my next question to you is, do we have any control over it? Or is it when it's your time, it's your time? Well, I, I do think, I think it, people, uh, human beings with free will, we do have control over it because we can take our own life. And, um, but I also do believe that uh, there's truth to the other aspect. I, I believe that, for instance, children who die at a young age were meant to live, uh, to die at a, at a young age and, and not live very long. I don't believe that any one of us is set up to die on, you know, October 5th, you know, 2000 something. I believe that um, we're supposed to accomplish certain things, and when we've accomplished them, then, uh, you know, one of the things I, I, didn't, I didn't mention, I, we were talking about God so much, I, I do believe that we're guided by spirit guides, you know, and I believe spirit guides are sort of taking this journey along with us. They're very focused on us and trying to help us um, accomplish what we came here to accomplish. And one of those things would be uh, to choose our exit point. And by that, I think they influence things. I don't think they can entirely uh, control them because, again, uh, human free will trumps all that. But, but they will try to lead us where there's opportunities. And sometimes illness is one of those ways that uh, will make that opportunity. So it's, it's, it's 
perfect uh, timing for our exit. And so it's a matter of, okay, they've accomplished what they've came here for, or there's no way they're going to accomplish what they came here for because of certain things that happened in their lifetime. Uh, or, well, you know, they've lived a good life and, uh, and it's, it's now time to, to go home, to come home. And so they set things up for us. And it's always about opportunity. And if we miss an opportunity because our free will says, I'm not going to get in that car, I'm not going to get on that plane, I'm not going to drive down that road, whatever it may be, um, then a new opportunity will show up shortly after. And so that's the way I understand uh, when we die. But I just want to say, you know, because there's a lot of people who have lost children. And one of the things that happens when we lose children is that um, – we always th think of, oh my God, the, the lost opportunity, you know, so much missed opportunity. And uh, my investigation has led me to believe that the opportunity for a long life never existed. And I, f I find comfort, comfort in this because uh, then I don't feel as though it was lost. I feel as though it was never intended to begin with. And we always knew that that person was going to die you know, at five, at 12, in their 20s, whatever it may be. Um, and uh, all the evidence that I've looked at indicates that, that these things, uh, the timing of our, lo of our death uh, does seem to be either controlled by our initial intentions uh, and then followed up by our spirit guides helping us to accomplish those as we had uh, sort of set it up to begin with. This has obviously impacted your life, your philosophical view of the world, this and the other. Um, can you share with us how this has impacted you? Yeah, you know, I, I had no idea this was going to happen. I, I, I was just interested in finding out the answer to what happened to my father. Where did he go, if anywhere? And the, the longer I was into this... I just seemed to gain uh, two things. One was this amazing sense of inner peace that overcame me. Um, I, think, I think it first overcame me. I, the first level of it was just me not fearing death anymore. I think there are so many both, I think we have physical maladies and, and psychological maladies that occur because of our fear of death. And you take that away and it gives you a sense of inner peace. It doesn't make your whole life perfect. Um, but it takes away a lot of the fear that we feel, which reduces a lot of the stress. And at least for me, that's where a lot of that peace came from. The second level of inner peace that came for me was just in trying is, is understanding why certain things happen. And I don't think I could answer it in a radio show like this because it's too, there's just, it's, there's too much depth to it. Um, but for me, I feel as though I understand why bad things happen to good people. And by understanding that, whether I'm right or wrong, because I feel like I at least understand why it happens, and, it, and then that gives me a sense of inner peace. Because I don't feel, for instance, if something bad happens to me, um, I don't feel as though now, because of all my understandings, some of which we talked about, I don't feel as though God is punishing me. I don't feel as though I've been overlooked by God. I don't feel as though, um, you know, God has its favorites and I'm not one of them. All those kinds of thoughts and feelings are gone now because I know I'm equal with everyone else. And I also understand that the experience, even if it's a challenging one, a negative one that I'm going through, is one that it, my soul is learning and growing from. It's something that it's going to retain for all eternity because we're eternal spiritual beings. And even though I may not like it right now, I recognize that my temporary suffering um, is something that's going to benefit me uh, for the rest of, you know, my spiritual existence. And those kinds of things really give me that sense of inner peace that I'm talking about. There's much more to it than, than this, but um, I think that'll give you a, an idea of what... I found by investigating the afterlife that I certainly didn't expect. I did an interview 20, 25 years ago with a, the wife of a Christian musician. She had been through her own personal um, substance abuse and had written a book about it regarding 12 steps <clears throat> and obviously incorporating it in the context of Christianity. 
And throughout the entire interview, she never once mentioned the responsibility for her problems were as a result of the devil. I bring it forward. Here we are uh, in this interview. And not once have you mentioned in our conversations about the afterlife, the hereafter, however you want to phrase it. You have never once mentioned the concepts heaven or hell. Do they exist? I don't use the word heaven generally because um, I feel as though it's more of a religious term. Um, at least that was the, the word I was using as a Catholic growing up. And I feel like there's other religions that don't necessarily use that word heaven. Um, I found myself using spirit world afterlife, even though that's a little bit of a misnomer because it's also before life, um, um, and, and all kinds of other terms that mean the same thing. So I also don't like to use the term heaven because so many people have these uh, predetermined thoughts about it based on what they learned from their religion. And, and a lot of times the evidence that I've found uh, indicates uh, something a little bit different than, than what I learned to be heaven. As far as uh, hell is concerned, um, I found no evidence of it. And there are some things that suggest evidence of it, and I explain them in the book. Uh, one of the things is some people who have had near-death experiences have had what we call a negative uh, NDE or a, a hellish uh, near-death experience. And this is a small percentage, maybe 15% or less of people who have had them that, that claim to have this. My understanding of it is that of that small percentage, many of them, it changed into a more, since we're using the word hell, I'll say a more heaven-like uh, experience for them because they recognized that what was happening is what, they were getting whatever it was that they were imagining. So if you imagine one thing, you experience it because we can have or do or be anything we want as spiritual beings. And so I think that for many of them, the reason they had the hellish experience is because it's what they expected. It's what they believed they were going to experience when they got there. And that, therefore, was the first experience they had. But for those people who were there long enough, because not everybody is, were there long enough to change that thought to something else, it immediately changed for them. And for some people, that meant calling out for help. And calling out for help actually means they believe there's another possibility that exists because you wouldn't call out for help unless you thought help might be there for you. And regardless of who they called out for, then once they called out for help, they imagined some, another possibility and that possibility changed for them. That's the only slight um, evidence that I ever found for hell otherwise, otherwise and, and now I can explain it away so I found no evidence of it and as far as the devil I think you know same thing very religious term I believe that it exists because of our fears and beliefs around hell if that doesn't exist I don't believe that uh, the devil exists I think if anything um, hell and whatever you might describe as the devil are just things that exist uh, within human beings. It's not a spiritual term at all. It's just another word that we could describe what happens to people while we're trying to get through life here. Absolutely. I, I certainly understand where you're coming from in that regards. And one of the reasons why I've always enjoyed my conversations uh, with rabbis, because the 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 level of insight that I have gleaned from them, especially in regarding some of these terms, has been just extraordinary. Uh, my own research in and of itself, uh, when I started the research in the Old Testament about the devil and any other terms referring, uh, always came back to a, not a personal being any more than a personal being uh, uh, called God was it was the, the those negative aspects were all nothing more than the lowest base nature of man. In other words, it was a part of us. We were the ones that exhibited the the devil or the devilish uh, attitudes and behaviors and mindsets. It was not something outside of us. That was what I found so fascinating. It is fascinating. I agree with it wholeheartedly. Um, and, and again, the only reason I think so many people believe uh, that it exists outside of the physical dimension is because that so many people want to think of 
of the other dimensions as being just like this one. So they carry everything over. But everything you just said, I I agree with uh, entirely. It's one of those aspects where, you know, we've become so attached to this world that we... um, I'm not even sure what the generic term of anthropomorphize is, but we project this world's, this existence onto the next and everything that isn't in this world that we can, that we can um, tangibly hold and define and dissect. Yeah, I I think, I think it's also a great moment to, to, to make the point that I believe that the reason that our souls choose to have a physical experience is because there is no evil there is no hatred or illness or tragedy um in the spirit world there's only love and peace and joy and so we have a physical experience because those things exist here they're a way when you know if you want to understand health and really appreciate your health get sick and you'll appreciate that health and see it from a different uh, pr- paradigm entirely. Uh, the same is true. So as spiritual beings, in order to really understand love and joy and peace, we come here and have a physical life where there are many challenges of all levels, and we're able to understand the love and joy and peace that we know as spiritual beings so much better. Yeah, absolutely. My guest is uh, Bob Olson, and he is the author of Answers About the Afterlife, a private investigator's 15-year research, unlocks the mysteries of life after death. How has the religious community, if they've even responded, to how have they reacted to your your work, your investigation? You you know, I I think I... I kind of held on to my seat um, when the book first came out because I wasn't sure how that would happen. Um, and, I, I, you know, for the most part, they've um, it's resonated with a lot of people of many different religions, including the Christian community. And but I, and but mostly this is these are the people who are more open minded about spirituality and they too there's so many people right now that uh of of follow a particular religion but they're not locked into the details of it you know all the things that i talk about in answers about the afterlife most of the christians who are open minded about it recognize that it it's just saying what they've believed all along. They tell me that everything that I write resonates with them entirely, even though the details of what I say versus what their religions say are different. And then there are those people who don't feel that way, and they don't like what I've written because they're the type of people who aren't ne- not necessarily um, self-thinkers, but they like to be told what to believe. Mm-hmm. And, and, and that's okay. You know, tell me what to believe because I have fear and I want to feel safe. And for those people, when they see the details are a little bit different, like my definition of God, um, then it's difficult for them and challenges them. And therefore they're, you know, they're not, they sort of cast it aside. Interesting. Interesting. Well, I, I have to say that, um, I, I, conducted interviews for 15 years at the station and at, at the station I worked back in Phoenix and uh, I was doing interviews like this but I would use the terminology that they understood and it kind of goes back to that same thing I was interested in sort of sort of opening the door a little bit just just a yeah. little bit to, to give a peek I didn't want to blast it open and blow people away and then create all kinds of other problems uh, because I was curious and and I found and just as you did uh, there were even authors that I interviewed and, and others who they didn't necessarily believe uh, all 327 rules and guidelines uh, of the faith that they were supposed to. They were they were thinking on their own. They were researching and searching on their own. And I found that so fascinating. Yeah, I, I think it's fascinating, too. I. You know, it's to me, it's the difference between what I call a belief and a knowing. And I, I, I believe we 
a belief is is when we've uh, taken somebody else's word for something, and so we now believe it on faith. We're taking somebody else's beliefs that they've passed on to us, and this can include what our religious leaders tell us, uh, and we say, okay, I'm going to believe in that because I don't know what else to believe in. And then that can go to a knowing, what I call a knowing, because now we've had experiences that it doesn't matter what other people's experiences are there are experiences as I mentioned earlier they're sacred to us we know they are true we know at a cellular some might call a soul level that these experiences are real and uh, and they're real for us and they don't have to be real uh, for anybody else and it becomes our knowing and therefore as we were t discussing earlier our truth and so that's sort of the difference. And I think most of the people that you're talking about, a lot of these people started with the belief. That's where religion really helped them. And then they opened up and started searching for more. And they, they, they tend, uh, over time, they gained knowings. They became a knower in one area or another. And, and that's, that's what happens with us. We don't become a knower of all things. We only become a knower of one little thing at a time, and we just keep you know, seeking more and more of it uh, over time. It's, uh, uh, you know, that again, it, it goes back to what I said before about uh, uh, my own personal evolution. And it was best uh, epitomized by a conversation I had with my sister. Unfortunately, I did it in the wrong place at the wrong time. It was at Thanksgiving amongst all of the rest of the family in the kitchen while the food was being cooked. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you learn. Yeah. And uh, I remember we were sitting there having a rather uh, a, a fairly good and heated conversation on religion and so forth. And I basically uh, responded to her at one point by saying, look, you know, my beliefs of yesterday are not my beliefs of today are not my beliefs of tomorrow because I'm always experiencing. I'm 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 gathering new information and so forth. And, and I'm trying to understand this world, let alone the next world that we live in. And uh, that didn't sit too well with her at that time. Uh, yeah. But be that as it may, um, I think that um, your approach, <clears throat> I think, is a very good one. Uh, you're just putting it out there and people can take it uh, for what it's worth. Uh, and you've got some some great information in there. I, I find it interesting the way you have it broken down and, and into the various sections. You have sev several different parts in here. Uh, you have very uh, you have different sections here, questions about spiritual communication, w which I know a lot of people are curious about questions about the afterlife and the spirit world, about uh, spirits, angels, ghosts, as well as um, wants and needs of spirits. I figured they already had all they wanted since they're on the other side. They can get whatever they want there. <laughs> um the, the one thing I want to talk about uh, before we wrap up our, our program here, I want to talk about, um, and I just, I just looked at it uh, a moment ago, and that has to do with uh, the, the concerns on the part of a lot of folks in this world about the process, about just... Uh, you know, th th there's a, a huge amount of fear. That's why I s usually stay away from terms like death and dying. And I just use the word, you know, transitioning, Yeah. you know, um, we're still talking about the same thing, but hopefully it's not evoking the same kinds of emotions. Um, what can you share with us about that process? About the process of dying? Yeah. Well, one of the things I, I've learned, first of all, dying can dying can be difficult. Dying can be painful, but death is not. OK, <laughs> um, so dying, I the way I describe it is, is still a phys we're still in the physical world and it's our transitioning to the other side. Now, it doesn't have to be difficult, doesn't have to be painful or anything else, um, and, but it, it can be for some people. We all know uh, people who have had a long, slow, painful death. Uh, as far as getting on the other side of the world, uh, on the other on the other dimension, uh, into the spirit world, there seems to be a point where our uh, our spirit checks out, 
And uh, for many people, and I've heard this with many people that were in accidents, plane accidents, uh, car accidents, other kinds of very tragic, impactful accidents, uh, where we'll say for plane accidents, uh, people have come through. I know, I know people who have lost loved ones in, in plane accidents, and they came through during readings with mediums, and they said that their spirit left their body long before the crash. And so this is something that can take place. Now, if the soul felt as though experiencing the, we'll say, the, the dying process of a particular illness is something that it would benefit from, uh, then that's, that wouldn't necessarily be the case. Now, why would a soul want to do that? One of the reasons is because um, it, when we have an experience like that, it gives us immense compassion for anybody who's experiencing that sort of thing. Um, there's a lot of there's a lot going on right now with ALS and the a ALS ice bucket challenge, as everybody's familiar with. Mm -hmm. um, the way that started was apparently somebody who had ALS was describing to his friend that having ALS felt like having freezing cold ice water poured over him, and uh, that's what that is supposed to represent. Well, he's having this experience. Well, he now, as a spiritual being, in both in the spirit world and even if he has uh, other lifetimes, he's always going to he, she, you know, it will, it'll, it'll have no gender at that point. But they will have compassion not only for, for the people who are experiencing that illness or disease, but for people who are supporting or caretaking for someone like that because they recognize it from many different sides and so that would be maybe one of the reasons is that someone would continue to suffer and not exit their body uh, early early on but a lot of times what happens with these plane crashes and stuff there'd be no purpose in staying in their body to experience what happened upon impact so they leave their body in that case and so that's the dying process and then once you get into onto the other side everybody's experience is a little bit different um, some will describe it as there's a transitionary period that sort of thing for the most part my understanding is there's no time over there um, it, it really if there's any transition period at all uh, it's very brief, and uh, we immediately gain the awareness that we had as spiritual beings before we came into this lifetime. We gain that back, and uh, and and so we're whole again. Hmm. I have to say that um, this conversation has been very interesting, and and I'm hoping that it is also for our listeners as well, and that uh, people will certainly check out uh, the book. Also, check out. The website. That's right. There is a website. There's also a television program we haven't even touched upon. Afterlife TV, which is the website, afterlifetv.com, where you can actually uh, watch uh, programs uh, with Bob Olson. And I, I'm going to guess you have guests on there talking about this uh, this whole subject from uh, several uh, uh, numerous different uh, detailed points of view. Yeah, it, that's that's exactly true. Authors, experts, people who have had experiences. The main reason I, I was doing this as, as I was investigating the afterlife, I always did it for myself. And in 2011, I decided, why don't I record these interviews so other people can can benefit from them as well? And that's how that started. Before we wrap up the program, a uh, final few questions for you. Who is Bob Olson? Oh, wow. Uh, that's a good question. Um you know, my private life, I, I'm a husband. I've been with my wife since she was 12 years old. I was 15 years old. Um, we've had a long life together. I'm now 51. Uh, this is what I do for a living. Um, I, uh, my wife helps me with it. So together we tackle uh, all the work that we do. We, um, we have a directory for psychics and mediums called bestpsychicdirectory.com. Over 800 psychics and mediums have all been screened and approved by me there. Uh, Afterlife TV is something we now do to try to educate the public. This book is something we, we, we use to try to educate the public. Uh, I even help to train psychics and mediums to uh, increase the standards upon which they uh, live and work. And uh, you're looking at it. I have a dog, <laughs> but this I'm kind of a workaholic, so my work really is my life. I understand. 
What is it that you hope to or want to achieve through the work that you're doing now? I guess, you know, it's interesting. I, I wonder, I, I keep wondering how long is this going to last? And, and, and then what happens is I, once I've, I feel as though I've seen it all, something new comes along and, and, and it's something that I haven't seen before. It's something new and it gets me all excited. And that passion that I felt, you know, at the beginning of this journey comes right back. And the way I am, uh, when, when I learn something new about anything, but certainly in this field, I just get so excited to tell everybody else about it. Cause I know if there's people like me, who find it fascinating. I mean, if I find it fascinating, I know other people will too. And so that's what keeps me going. It's like you know, that lottery ticket that you scratched and it won. It makes you want to keep buying them for whatever, months, months longer before you get another one. Every time I learn something new to me, some new way of understanding the afterlife, um, that just keeps me going for a little while longer. But I think in the very end, uh, if I had to get at the very basis of it, it's um, I feel as though my work helps people who are grieving, um, people who are suffering with the loss of a loved one. I know that understanding life after death gives them comfort. Uh, it doesn't take away their grief, but it certainly helps uh, to comfort their grief so that they're able to function in, in society as, as the rest of us. And that's what gets me up uh, in, the, in the morning. And finally, who inspires you? Oh wow! You know this 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 is just, just sounds silly, but uh, honestly, my wife, <laughs> my wife, uh, you know, someone who I've been together since we were young teenagers. Um, she, without having to do all the research that I've done, has become uh, sort of the spiritual being and practice that I hope to be. And uh, she, she's, you know, she's that Buddha who is the example to all others. She, she's the example to me. And I look at her and the way she emanates love uh, with uh, unconditional love for everyone, animal, human being, it doesn't matter. And I, I just want to be more like her. So uh, that's what I'm hoping that I'll achieve before, before I die. Well, Bob Olson, I want to thank you so much for uh, sharing this time with us here on the program. It's great to, to have you and have our listeners uh, find out more about the afterlife through your uh, investigation. And we certainly hope to stay in touch with you and uh, see the kinds of work that you're doing. I was just noticing at the afterlife uh, TV.com website that uh, you have tools for everyday people to communicate with spirits as one of your programs coming up. Uh, and I'm sure that there are dozens of other programs as well. And uh, that um, we get a chance to uh, to investigate some of these other folks as well. And and uh, who knows, maybe there'll be a, a part two to this uh, to this sojourn. Yeah, I, well, that's right. I, I, I thank you, Richard. This has been such a pleasure for me. I love it when someone understands these things the way you do and asks these incredibly meaningful questions that, that makes me think and just brings back all my passion. So thanks so much, Richard. You're very welcome. And uh, I would assume that the, the research, uh, is, is there going to come a point when you're going to say, okay, I've done enough research. I know. I, I got it. I got it. <laughs> or is this, is this literally just, there's, never, there's no end to this? Yeah, I think there's no end to it because of, of what you said. You know, uh, we, our truth evolves. And, and mm. I just I look forward to what tomorrow's truth is going to be. It never changes that much, but I love to have a little bit of a greater awareness um, and any chance that I can get. So that's what keeps me going. Great. AfterlifeTV.com is the website. Answers about the afterlife. A private investigator's 15-year search unlocks the mysteries of life after death. Bob Olson, host of AfterlifeTV.com. We certainly hope you'll check that out as well. We will be linked to him. I'm Richard Dugan. This has been Tell Me Your Story, New Paradigms for a New World. We're giving you choices and knowledge of those choices to help make your dreams come true. Until next time, Love to lol.